All right. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the second edition of Growth Talks. Thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for taking the time. I'm Michel Gagnon. I'll be your host. I am Global Managing Director of Plista, a net tech company based in Berlin. I'm also Strategic Advisor for Stunena, who is hosting the event today. I have two great guests for you. No pressure, guys. But uh, just before we get started, I just want to cover a few housekeeping items. The first one is uh, for our audience. You are more than welcome to ask questions. On the right-hand side, in the sidebar, you should have a question tab where you can ask questions. So don't be shy. There are no, there's no such thing as a dumb question. And you have access to two guys who really know their stuff. They have a lot of experience. So I really want you to take that opportunity to ask the tough questions. So. Without further ado, let's get started. We have uh, an hour and a half. I think it's more than enough for us to cover quite a lot of ground. And just before I get started, uh, and instead of me trying to introduce you like an ambassador would be introduced, I think it's maybe easier if I uh, pass the mic to you guys. Uh, it'd be great if you just tell us a bit, you know, who you are, a bit about your experience and where you are today. So Arvid, do you want to break the ice? Sure. I'll try to be quick. So I used to be a software engineer, and then I used to be an entrepreneur, and then I turned into an author, and now I'm all three. So that's where I am. Um, I, uh, I built a business with my partner in, in 2017, and we uh, got it to $55,000 MRR and sold it in 2019 to a private equity company. So that's that's my most recent big success. Ever since then, I've been a writer. And before, I failed a lot. So we can talk about that too, maybe. So I'm, I'm just from the, the whole indie hacking entrepreneurial space. That's why I'm at. That's where I'm currently working, writing books about the topics and just trying to help founders find a way into entrepreneurship that is not running into walls too much, but also not believing that it's super easy and everybody could do it. Like somewhere in the middle, right? That's where I am. And that's what I'm focusing my work on. Thanks. That's a fair place to be. Uh, what about you, Alexei? Yeah, so my story starts when I uh, was 16, I started to build websites, HTML, CSS, and sold them to clients. Uh, and then I realized, actually, this business thing is pretty cool. Uh, and and uh, my approach is usually to learn from the world champions. So I went to Rock Internet, which at that time was um, quite successful in building uh, companies, also ipo some of them. Of obviously, many failed, very polarizing. That's where I learned everything about entrepreneurship and, and marketing and growth. Um, I was one of the first employees of Fedora, uh, a pink uh, delivery service, um, which uh, was really big in Germany and then sold later. I was um, running the marketing team uh, for customer acquisition, for ride acquisition, uh, and we scaled the business within three years from zero to, um, from one city to 100 plus cities and 20 markets, uh, uh, Australia and Canada. So uh, time zones uh, have been hard on me in that time. Um, and uh, yeah, manage uh, the scale business to have a billion of, of GMV, so really, really big, uh, big budgets um, and so many mistakes, so many mistakes. Uh, to nowadays, I'm saying we succeeded not because of what we did, but but in spite of what we did, um, uh, we still somehow succeeded, uh, made, made the IPO together with the Lyric Hero. Uh, and then I left because it got a bit too corporate for me. Uh, since then, I'm advising um, all kinds of startups, for example, also to mobility which is uh, probably quite known and many others um, on, on growth and marketing. Uh, on the other hand, also angel investing on 15 portfolio companies. So I'm really passionate about helping founders and marketers to succeed. Great. Well, I, I have the impression that you did better than me because you kept your hair in spite of the time zones, craziness and, and stress. Well, uh, thanks, guys. Uh, it's a really um, it's great to have you uh, with us. I'd like to get started with something with the beginning, I would say. Uh, you've talked about some of the mistakes that you have made, and I think many startup founders, many of us, make the mistake of building a product and then looking for customers. And both of you have, I would say, a strong opinion on uh, how it should be done. Uh, Arvid, you've talked about starting with your audience first. Alexei, you've also mentioned in a podcast uh, with us that will come out soon that whenever you think about marketing tactics, Instead of thinking about, you know, how can I scale a marketing tactic, you should find something that you where you could actually target one person and, you know, really try to understand them, make sure that it works. So uh, I'd, I'd like we to start with that and maybe just try to give you the, the space to elaborate a bit. Maybe Arvid, if you want to start about, 
audience first and also the importance of validating your ideas before building something. How do you go? Uh, yeah, I, I was going to jump into this like really with the, the concept of validation, right? Because like the idea of uh, doing something without figuring out if it's a good idea, you just don't really like conceptually you wouldn't do it, but many founders do. They skip these initial parts. And I feel um, when we talk about validation, we, we should also, um, but before we go into how to do this, because there's many, many different ways um, to validate a business or a business idea or an audience or a problem or whatever we get into, I really want to point out one thing, like the concept of validation itself is kind of questionable because you can't really validate anything. Right? You can't say, oh, I wish I could validate this and then do some magical thing and then you have a perfect guarantee that it's going to work. That does not exist. Right? So when we talk about validation or when I talk about validation at least, what I mean is trying to invalidate the thing as much as possible and failing at that. Right, trying to find the little mistakes, trying to find counterexamples to a theory, and then just after a while giving up on trying to find these, that is validation. But you can't say, oh, I found this this reasonable assumption and now it's going to be true forever. It's just in a changing market and a changing world, that's not going to work. So validation to me means trying to invalidate something and failing at that. So it's mostly valid. And um, to your point of people starting with an idea and a product, that just seems to be a common curse among entrepreneurs. Like people really, really want to build things, right? They want to build stuff. They want to build a business that does X. They don't necessarily think of the people that it's going to serve initially. They just think of the product, of the, the thing that they're going to build, which is, I believe, a consequence of us being taught as product people, as marketing people, and as engineers to create things, to create products, to create software, to create tangible things. So all we do in our professional experience, particularly when we come from a salaried employee background, right? And I'm talking as a an entrepreneur, as a like a, as a founder here, somebody who builds their own business, not for somebody else, but for themselves. We always think of deliverables, things we need to do, and then we hand them over, and then we do something else. So conceptually, everything we approach in the world is a deliverable. So when we see a problem somewhere, we don't necessarily think of going deep into the problem and analyzing that, but we think of the solution, of the deliverable, and focus all our attention on that, which is why we have so many products being built by, by founders, either by solopreneurs or by people building a small business, that are solutions to problems, maybe, and those problems may be actually felt by other people. So this all all the stuff in between, like between the audience, the, the people you want to help, their, their their problem that they feel, and the solution that you actually built, all of that is not validated in in many businesses. Which is why there's so many businesses on product hunt or on um, yeah, just on on Twitter being launched, and then they fizzle out because because there's no audience for the product. So my approach, and I'm trying to keep this kind of condensed. I don't want to have a 30 minute um, monologue here is to, to start with the people. It's to really figure out who do I want to help and then go into deep into their problem space, which is usually done by just joining their communities, by hanging out with them, by talking to them, you know, like trying to validate that they actually have problems, then figuring out which of these problems are the most interesting ones, validating that again, like seeing if they are actually commonly felt and painful, and then, only then, trying to think of how can I solve this problem. And um, uh, I, I would really like to know how Rocket approached that kind of stuff because there's a lot of interesting businesses being built or that were built and still are, I guess, uh, by Rocket that, that are really, really um, problem centric. And then there's some that are not. <laughs> so, do you know, like there, there's a white space. There's like, like I, I would assume dozens, if not hundreds of different businesses in that, in that uh, ecosystem. So, um, Alexei, what, what's your opinion on that stuff? Yeah. So what Rocket did is they actually used, uh, or actually copied uh, or built pre-validated businesses, right? So mm -hmm. they were looking for something that was validated, had product market fit, and they copied it. The issue was that either they didn't understand what actually had product market fit, so they copied it wrong, or they mm -hmm. copied the market where uh, the systems are different. That's why many businesses fail. Um, but um, you're completely right. Um, uh, Rocket never tried to do something completely from scratch, solving a new problem. Um, because they were not good in what you just said. They were good in building things. Um, and also that's the environment, the professional environment I grew up uh, in. 
basically focus on building things and doing things and not trying to understand the actual humans. So in terms of marketing, I grew up in marketing. It's uh, so basically the, the CMO of Rock Inset who hired me, um, she marketing officer was mathematician. So you can imagine what, what that means for the marketing approach of Rock Internet. So basically, when I learned marketing was uh, now a Google spreadsheet or actually an Excel file with all the numbers and optimizing the numbers, right? Moving budget here. And then when we wanted to, um, I mean, it's really extreme. When we wanted to, to optimize the creative, so the, the, the ads, we went to the, to the creative department and said, please do better ads. <laughs> so, wow. which kind of doesn't make any sense because how, what, what, what does it mean better ads? Like, um, so, so that, that's, that's where rocket and, and I come from. And then over time I realized that we are not growing through this, through this, um, uh, approach. Uh, and, 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 uh, and I realized that in the end, it's similar to what you said, Arvid, it's about actual humans. And, and for me as a, as a framework, I try to imagine an actual human, like one single person, an actual human of flesh and blood that I'm trying to convince to do what I want them to do, right? To buy my product, use my product, whatever. Um, and and um, I basically think, okay, what if I would meet this person in uh, face to face? Like if I would actually have a one to one meeting, uh, which you don't do in a B2C context or some, right? Or in a, in a, but, and then if you're not able to convince this person to, to use or buy your product, then you will never ever be able to do it digitally because you as a founder or, or um, mastermind behind it um, or, or chief marketer, you are the best person to, to explain it. But if you're not even able to explain the value to that single person, then, then something is completely wrong. So, so what, basically, how do I try to solve this is to reverse engineer by having this person in mind, it can be a friend of you, like someone really concretely out of, uh, you know, flesh and blood and try to understand who are they? What do they have? What problems do they have? Um, uh, uh, what needs do they have? And what do they do the, uh, uh, all day long, right? So which platforms and which media, so really understanding them. And only after that, you can try to sell whatever you have. Um, and, and that's what we didn't learn and uh, what, what, you know, what I needed to, to learn over time um, by trying it out. And actually nowadays, when I, when I start working with, as a, the last anecdote, um, and I come in, in uh, to work with a team, um, the first, I ask them, like, what do we know about the customers? Like, why do they buy? Why don't they buy? Or my favorite question, why didn't they almost not buy? So basically, why did customers almost not buy? So it's the ones that did bought, but still didn't like something. And then you can ask about what didn't like. And, and most people don't have any, any, any answers to that. So I come in, we do a workshop, and then I ask the founders one hour to just call the customers. Mm -hmm. like, literally, like, so we have this workshop, you know, whiteboard, everything, and I, let's call them together now. And, and this actually always has worked um, because we got so many insights that we could never have by just, you know, research and thinking. And, and uh, if we go to, I think uh, conceptually it all makes sense. And if we go to the next uh, level of analysis, uh, Arvid, you talked about uh, joining groups. I'm part of a lot of groups on LinkedIn, Facebook, and uh, I see a lot of people pitching their idea, which is again, uh, it's not, I guess it's, it's a good second step of, of validation. It's better to pitch an idea, especially if you've not spent the past 12 months building it. But um, ideally what we're looking for is, is for us to ask questions, right? Yeah. Uh, or because I think Arvid, you talk a lot about this also, it's, it's about listening and, and it's very similar to what you would see with a, with user interviews, right? Or what you mentioned, Alexei, like, say about, let's call the customer and, and ask question. Um, any tips on, you know, the type of questions you would ask or how do we try to dig deeper? Because for some, it may be obvious for others, like how do you actually, what's the, what's the recipe to uncover unsolved problems? If there's one. <laughs> well, I, I'm, I, I can, give like half of a reply because I bet Alexei has a better half for, for the other part. Um, what you already kind of hinted at something here, like when you are part of a community, when you're part of, I don't know, a Facebook group or even the Twitter ecosystem around a certain kind of industry, LinkedIn groups, any kind of semi-closed, tight-knit community, the worst thing you can do is to try to sell from the start. Because if you're trying to explore what problems they have or what the reality of their life is, why would you ever distort it with your thing? 
right? You're trying to figure out what the reality of these people is without your thing. So why would you throw it in there from the beginning? There is a point when you should start making sales, right? When you should start talking to people to actually purchase your solution. But that point is when you've figured out what problem you're already solving. Right? If you if you do this way before, first off, you're you're limiting yourself to what the, I would say like restricted amount of information you have at that point, and you're distorting the community. And honestly, most communities really don't like people marketing to them um, without knowing them. Most people don't really like when they see somebody trying to like push something there that is only benefiting them, like the, the person selling it, and not the community at all. So there's a lot of mistakes to be made by by just selling instead of dwelling. It's like a really, yeah, it's not a good wordplay, but I'm, I'm trying to go for it, right? Dwell, don't sell. That's like my my idea of the initial phase when you try to discover something in a community, just lurk, be there, listen, observe, and maybe have communication with individual people or ask questions. And that's uh, um, the second part, but I'm gonna go into the observing part for a minute here because you can learn a lot by just listening and making, take, just taking notes. Right? There's so many um, pieces of information in, a, in any given community that, cur that consistently exchanges information where people just talk on a daily basis. People complain about stuff. People ask for help. People ask for recommendations. People ask for alternatives to existing products. And those four things, this is quantifiable. You, you can say to any kind of message where a person has a problem and is looking for something, it's either one of these four things. And either of these is a different stage of people's awareness of the problem, right? If they, if they complain, they don't really know that there are solutions out there. If they ask for help, they know that they have a problem, um, but they don't really know how to solve it. At the moment they ask for a recommendation, they know that there are things, so they ask for what they can get. And the moment they ask for an alternative, they know that there's this one thing, but it's not good enough. So all these little messages that just pop up in people's questions and conversations, they are insights into their reality. Because the, when you see that people are complaining about the same piece of software, day in and day out, oh, I have to use this and it really doesn't work. Is there a better thing? And people say no. Well, as an entrepreneur, should you not build that thing, right? Is, that's where this information comes from, from within the community. And you don't really need to talk for this. Like, obviously, at some point, you can start engaging in this conversation and ask people, okay, so why doesn't this work? Like, what is the problem there? Or for somebody who is just like crying for help and doesn't know that they have a problem, you can ask them, well, what are you experiencing? What is What are you running into that should be easier but isn't, right? These are the kind of things that you can have um, as a conversation in public in these communities. And if that is too much for you, you can always like send direct messages or send emails to the people in these communities However, this is structured in any given community. On Facebook, it would be a DM. On LinkedIn, it would be a DM. On Twitter, it would be a DM. In public forums, it would probably be just a private message or an email because you can see where they are. It doesn't matter. Just reach out to people and just try to understand more about them. Right? That That is the, the kind of communication that you can do. And that would be a, a customer interview without necessarily having anything to sell. It would just be a customer exploration conversation. And there's this great book called The Mom Test by, by Rob Fitzpatrick that um, gives you insight into how to talk to people and how not to talk to people. But the whole idea behind the book is to um, avoid questions that you would ask your mom. M mom, I built this. Do you like it? What do you think she's going to say? Right? She's, she's not going to like strip it down and destroy your business idea. She's just going to say, oh, yeah, this is really sweet. Go on. This is an awesome idea. right? Yeah. Obviously, it's not going to help you with your customers if you ask them, hey, I built this. Do you like it? It's not a question that you want to ask a customer. And the book goes into depth, but I, I bet Alexei has even more insights on, on that particular subject, like what to ask, what not to ask. So just, I'm just going to push that to you at this point. Right. I, I love the idea to harvest uh, these insights from existing communities. Um, in the consumer space, ex communities are around are on Instagram, actually, around influencers or brands. Um, so, so there are different ways. So, that, so one might ask, how do I find these communities? And then actually you need to start with individuals that you know that are part of it. Like so so so, so basically in also right in our research, we want to get into those communities, but often you don't know, right? Is there a Facebook group? Is is it something happening on Reddit? And you're not part of it, it's hard for yeah. you to know. So you need to find the first ones. And and even it's for the introverted one, ones of us, it's it's not really pleasing or, into, or like hard to actually speak to people on the phone or video call. Even just doing one or two calls and 
no matter how prepared you are, like whether you read the book or not, whether you have the right question or not, it doesn't matter. The first, the second, the third call they will have so much impact. And I think almost no one uh, in, in, in this room uh, and also in my, from my previous experience, like almost no one does it. But even just one, two, three calls will have so much impact. So like just throwing out all the best practices, let's just do it, right? And talk to them. And then if you have them on the, on, on the phone, yes, don't try to sell at all. It's not a goal to sell. Um, you know, just, just end the call and don't even try to sell. It's really about exploration. It's just trying to understand. And, and, and there the questions are should be super open. So for me, if, if it's something about the fitness industry, it's so like, how do you train out? Why do you train out? What's the problem by training out? It's like basically different kinds of questions um, uh, that, that you can think about, brainstorm. It really doesn't matter which ones, right? So I, I want to you know, reduce the hurdle. It's like, you know, it's not like you need to do it right. I mean, it's great if you do it right. If you, great if you read the book that I would mention is amazing, but they just call them and ask them some open questions and you will learn so much that it's going to be worth it. And then you do the second one where you, you know, ask little better questions and so on. And then after five calls, you will have so much insight into your customers' problems and your customers that uh, everything's going to change. I really want to jump jump in here again. Thank, thanks for that because um, sorry, did I interrupt you? Like, no. <laughs> okay. This this um, community discovery thing that you uh, talked about initially when when you just started talking, like figuring out where communities are by asking people where they hang out. This is this is like a magical thing once you do this, right? Because you you have the sense of okay, people are there, but you don't know where they actually are. And I've been doing this with professional people in really niche industries, right? Let's say like a plumber. Um, I, where, what do I know, right? Where plumbers, like people who, who are like do pipe fitting and stuff, where they hang out, I have no idea. So in actually talking to one, they, they, get, they um, directed me to a forum, like a super obscure web forum that has 40,000 plumbers in it talking about plumbing all day. I would never have found that if I hadn't talked to this person. And then in that forum, you find other people with other communities that they're part of, like YouTube channels and you know all this stuff. It's almost a recursion. It's like you go in, you ask, where do you hang out? Then they say, oh, I'm there. And then you go there and then you ask, where do you hang out? And some people will point back, but other people will point into other directions. You can build this knowledge graph of a whole community and all these interconnected nodes by just consistently asking new people, where do other people hang out? And then going there and talking to people there. This is, it's easy to do because you literally just need to start talking to some people. Right, but um, you you have to know that this is an actual option that you have. You don't have to magically know everything. You can just ask people where they hang out and to get you in there because some of these communities are invite only. Particularly, you have this on LinkedIn, you have this on on, on Facebook, Instagram. I guess not so much, but you know some of these professional communities where experts talk to other experts. You have to prove that you are part of their clique part of their community to be able to be allowed into this particular instance. So by asking people, where do you hang out? You might just snatch a little invitation from them or some help to get you into this community because they understand that you're there for a good reason. You want to help, right? You're not just there to sell, which is why you shouldn't sell. Because if people have this idea that you might start selling at some point, they will not help you. But if you're just there and you're curious, you're trying to figure out how you can help them, they will kind of shuffle you uh, in, or just put you into these other communities by just helping you get in. And that is very beneficial. I guess this, I'm, I'm, I'm mostly talking about B2B just to make sure because you, you just mentioned like the, the, the consumer segment, all the things that I've been building with a couple exceptions were B2B or B2BC, like, like the freelancer market, which is kind of a consumer, but kind of a business, like a prosumer somewhere in between. So this these communities that I talk about are like almost exclusive expert professional communities. And, and they have more restrictions to joining than I would assume consumer communities, just communities of hobbyists or interests have, but you mm -hmm. might run into them and just be aware that other people might help you getting in. And I think it's ultimately applicable also for B2C communities because in the end it's actually humans and, and uh, you know, the, the, the need for a connection is everyone has them. And yeah. all, everyone is also influenced either it's by the boss, the finance department, the, the spouse, you know, the, 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 the girls you want to attract, it uh, doesn't matter. There's always someone influencing you uh, no matter. And, and maybe one anecdote um, on the community thing. So I was actually about to build a beauty brand some years ago. 
um, uh, for women and talk to, to women, right? And, and then I, um, and, and one person told me there is this Reddit sub, subreddit forum where people celebrate when they empty uh, cosmetics items, right? <laughs> so, so I was like, what the fuck? Like, I, I didn't understand it. And, and then I understood it. Why, why does this exist? Because it's so rare. That's good. So That's awesome. That, that the cosmetic <laughs> thing is, is, so what does it mean? It means that it's great to you to buy new stuff and try out new stuff. And then it's like, you know, and, and, and like you need to use it for many, many months until it's empty. And then I realized, okay, so if people buy new stuff, like to buy new stuff, then it's like fashion. Mm -hmm. Because yeah. fashion also you have like these seasonal, um, you know, there's always something new happening, right? New, new drops. It's like, okay, so why don't you do drops for beauty? And, yeah. and then I think if you look now out for the, all the new beauty brands, it's always like okay, avocado, snail oil, like it's always something new, but it's basically the same. Um, mm -hmm. Insights, um, as a man, not really using lots of cosmetics, um, I would never have gotten if I would have not tapped into these uh, communities. Yeah, Reddit that, is crazy, what... right? Sorry. <laughs> yeah, but that, I, that... Go ahead. Oh, yeah, I was just trying to say, like, Reddit has everything. Like, there's literally everything on Reddit. Like, if you have a niche and you wonder, like, what these people are thinking about, do the, this kind of uh, community exploration just within Reddit. Go to a person that is in some subreddit that connects with what you want to do and figure out the other subreddits that they're part of. Either just go into their profile and, 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 and see them there or ask them. And they will find the most obscure subreddits, like the one you were just talking about, that you would never consider, but you will find them and you can find this whole graph and there's a lot of analytics sites and like um search sites externally for reddit where you have uh I, I don't really know the names but just like reddit search or something just google for that where you can find all the specific kind of subreddits what they connect to what people in those reddits that post a lot are also using there's a lot of additional information and you can source quite a bit on reddit just really from understanding the subreddits that are so specific that people are joining but i'm i'm, I'm done i'm not <laughs> all right finished. you're allowed you're allowed that, that's why you're you're on the show um one thing that i i tend to agree with you is that founders sometimes spend a bit too much time in, at their office or home trying to figure out like should we develop this or that and in my experience a bit like you both mentioned is that when you start talking to people it becomes so obvious what needs to be solved, right? As opposed to trying to, you know, spend another hour with your founders on a whiteboard, you know, should we do this feature or that? Should we develop the, that product in that direction? So I totally agree, but I want to kind of move uh, to the next phase, which is startups are super today data driven. Um, I mean, or they should be as much as possible. There's a lot of, of tools available to us compared to, I don't know, 10, 20 years ago. We've talked about audience discovery, discovery, finding problems. When can you say that you have a problem that is big enough to be solved or to work on? You know, when, because you can talk to a few folks and they say, yeah, yeah, this would be great. You know, I need a, a faster horse. Um, but in the end, uh, they are not necessarily statistically uh, relevant. So um, when or do you have any tricks or, or methods to be able to say, well, I've reached a certain point where I think there's an appetite for my solution? Alexei, do you have any ideas? I'm still thinking. Yeah, so, so, so I can do it for B2C, you can do it for B2B. Yeah. Right. So um, yeah, common crash, like common, common challenge. Um, I think there are there actually two, two pretty tactical things that I, I believe are a good indicator. And um, they are um, CTR, so click-through rate, and conversion rate, which are maybe non-obvious. Non um, so it's basically, um, uh, I will tell you uh, an anecdote that will uh, help you to understand why. So, and this is what I learned from entrepreneur first. You need to find a hair on fire problem. What does it mean? That if your hair is on fire, the solution doesn't matter. So you take a brick and put out the hair. I mean, it's a horrible solution, but it's works, right? <laughs> so it's like, if, right? So, so it's like, the problem is your hair is on fire and you see an ad, take this brick, the conversion rate, and the, so the click-through rate is gonna be 1% and the conversion rate is gonna be 100%, right? The click-through rate 
uh, how many people see an ad and click conversion rate, how many get on a landing page or app and, and download and become customer user. Right. So, so find a problem that, that I, th I think, um, so that's why I like to look at, at uh, click through rates and conversion rates. Um, if the click through rates, so, so the click through rate is really, um, depending on the, on the platform, right? So Instagram, uh, feed, for example, 0 0.5 to 1%, Facebook's one to 2%, um, uh, in some stories a bit lower, right? So it's really depending on, 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 on the platform also really depending on the industry. So it's really different, difficult. So try to find other people in the same space and ask them what they have. Um, but if you have, if you are like above, uh, others uh, benchmark, then, then you know that at least what you're showing to offer people find interesting. So, um, there were some businesses, um, in, in the automotive space where we, uh, had a 50 plus, uh, audience on Facebook and we had 10% CTR. Right. So, like, uh, usually it's again, between 0.3 and maybe 1%. So it's like extremely high, but obviously everyone above 50 who is men or almost everyone above 50 with men is interested in cars. So if you put, you know, if you give a nice, nice, uh, car ad, they're going to be interested in looking at it. Uh, and then the second one is conversion rate. It's the same. So, so that's more like, is the offer interesting conversion rates also, uh, what's the price, what's the effort, like these more, um, uh, more detailed questions. And also if the, then the, if the conversion rate is also good, then you know that you have the product market fit. Um, and, uh, and basically comparing it to the benchmarks is, I think a really, really good indicator, whether you are really solving a problem. But, but just to make sure that we don't encourage people on, on this webinar to start building too fast, there's a way to test uh, these metrics before building the whole product, right? So you yeah, can... So, you... So, so, so yeah, uh, thank, thanks for mentioning it. So, so with a few hundred euros, for example, or even less, you can basically do a smoke test where you pretend to offer what you're offering. So either you have these in Facebook uh, lead form ads, which are amazing. So it's like you, you basically have an ad, you pretend that you're already offering it and then people can sign up and this is like a good indicator or you just use at any page for like waiting list. Um, so that's a really, really good indicator whether people are interested um, in what you're offering. Um, I mean, you can even do a Shopify shop and then, you know, uh, refund then the ones that bought. <laughs> um, so you're actually really simulating. Um, so that I think depending on what you're building, they always like easy tools uh, or things to, you know, to to do like a prototype, a smoke test within like a few hours. Great. What about you, Arvid? Like you've built a few SaaS platform um, with, I think, Feedback Panda, which is the most recent. I think you got, you were so into the community that you, I think you had enough data and feedback to be able to say, yes, this is something to, that we should build or? Right. Uh, yeah. F feedback from the community is like the holy grail, right? Like if you if you actually know that that people would or will buy this, which is kind of hard to quantify um, for something that doesn't exist within a smaller community, it's kind of hard to to run um, numerically significant numbers and a community of a couple hundred people. Um, and in B2B, it's it's more complicated because budget and um, purchasing agency lives in different spaces. Like you may not have access to them that easily. Um, that At least that's what I what I feel in certain uh, B2B fields in certain industries. Um, this, this kind of smoke test is kind is hard to, to get because you, you have to be so specific with your solution, particularly if you're building a bootstrap business, which is like this really laser focused solution to a particular problem that there's not enough search volume for you to begin with to do these particular tests. I think in a, in a consumer space, there's just a lot going on. And if you don't really know what you're doing just yet, it's hard to find these, these low volume um, or find solutions or find meaningful information from these low volume searches. So what I would suggest is um, doing more research that um, <clears throat> is still grounded in the reality out there, such as guesswork, but it, but looking at competitive alternatives, that's one of them. So two things I wanna talk about is competitive alternatives and budget. And competitive alternatives is essentially competitors in the space that already exist, like solutions to this problems, uh, to th this particular problem that people already pay for, or, so, and the term competitive alternative is, is one that was coined by, by April Dunford. That's why I heard it first in, in her book, Obviously Awesome, which is about positioning. And it's not just competitors, right? Competitive alternatives is essentially all the ways that people solve this problem right now. And if you want to find a critical problem to solve, um, doesn't necessarily mean that people already are paying a software as a service solution like the one you want to build, right? It could just be that they have hire an intern for this kind of stuff. 
or it's like jobs to be done essentially or they they use i don't know like google sheets because it's free and they've kind of built their own little system it, it's not good it's really it's just like allowing them to scrape by but it's solving the problem and they have to solve it so critical problems have a, a lot of properties that you can source in the wild and um while doing this kind of uh, community observation that I talked about earlier, you can like write down, does it have these properties? Is it commonly felt? Is it time sensitive? Can you defer it? Because if you can give somebody else this task, it may not be as critical. Is it urgent? Is it important, right? All these little things. And um, if, if you have a, if you do your observation right and, and have a little list where you, you can kind of check these things off and, and turn this into like meaningful data just during your observation. Um, yeah, so competitive alternatives is important to understand that not everything that is competing with you and your potential solution is a product like yours. It could just be a, a job, somebody else's job that you're trying to take away. So you have to at least provide as much value as possible um, or as much value as they do with their job and then charge less for it, right? That's just uh, the idea. And that brings me to the next part, um, which is budget. And budget is something that many people don't seem to really think about when they build something. They think, okay, I'm gonna build Tinder for cats, or I'm gonna build this particular tool for people who love coffee. You know, like I'm um, just like a, an app for tracking your the, the perfect settings on your coffee machine. And I'm gonna charge them 10 bucks a month for it. But they forget that people who drink coffee already spend all their money on coffee, right? And they don't have a budget, an existing budget for widgety apps that help we find the perfect settings. They, what do they use? They use a notepad or like they just have the setting already set on the machine and they never change it. So if there's no budget for things like this that you might want to build um, it, that already exists within the community of people who, who have this problem, hopefully commonly shared problem, then you will have trouble building a meaningful business. So that is the kind of validation step that I would take within the community is to understand the competitive alternatives and to see if there's a budget. And with Feedback Panda, we did that as well. It's a good example because um, the, the competitive alternatives in our case were people building their own systems to deal with student feedback. Essentially, like you taught for half an hour online. This was like English as a second language. Um, the people that we sold to were teachers, online teachers, and they taught kids in China how to speak English over the internet. And for every half hour that you teach, you have to write like a couple paragraphs for the parents um, to understand what the kid learned today. And, and you would just write it out by hand. And people already understood this is taking way too much time. I can speed this up. So they built their little templating systems in Word and Google Sheets and whatever. It was crude. It was like a lot of moving parts, but they had systems in place. And that was the competitive alternatives. It wasn't a service that they already paid money for. It was just something that they built because they needed help with that. That was good. It was good to see that there was actually a competitive alternative. Because if you want to try to solve a problem and people don't even have something in place to solve it right now, is it really a problem, right? It's If, if they don't care, you're not going to make money from solving it because obviously they don't need a solution. Otherwise, they would already be looking for one. And budget was the other part. Um, and we're, we're talking about online teachers, which like teachers all over the planet are severely underpaid and not helped at all, right? So uh, they, they, there was a question, do they even have a budget for this? Do they understand that they might need to pay for software? But in our case, we found that people actually had a budget because whenever a new teacher would join this community of online teachers, the, the other teachers in, in, in the space that already were teaching told them, hey, you have to buy this piece of software, Minicam, which allows you to put funny backgrounds into your, your webcam so the kids are engaged. So they already understood that paying money for software in this space is increasing the quality of their work. And since we had competitive alternatives and the budget, there was a clear opportunity for us to build a solution that people would pay money for. And I've seen this both with people I consult for and people that I mentor in many spaces. The moment in B2B where you have competitive alternatives, either competitors or other tools, and you have budget for tools like this, for, for, for solutions to this problem or similar problems, you have a pretty clear shot at making money with the business. Uh, pretty good point. Um, and I think uh, your budget comment is, is so important because there are so many apps today that we have. And sometimes, you know, people say, well, it's only, you know, I'm, I'm not, I'm only going to charge them nine bucks a, a month. 
Um, but you have to keep in mind that these people are already paying a lot of nine months, you know, on top of uh, other things uh, and other services that they already have. I agree. Uh, just before we move on, I want to make sure we get uh, John's question regarding Facebook lead generation test. His problem that he found is that uh, how to target the right audience to validate properly. So, Alex, say, do you want to take that yeah. one? So what I, what I like to do is to um, start with um, including everyone, 18 to what, 65 plus, um, and just uh, and then and then after you, know, you spend 50 euro, 100 euro, you can see uh, in the in the breakdown who clicked actually, right? And, and and usually you see a clear trend. For example, the car thing that I thought I said before, the older, the more the, the higher the CTR, right? For example, um, and 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 vice versa. So you really see see based on the CTR which audience is more uh, that's more relevant. Um, and obviously you don't see the interest and the second, uh, um, so, so I think in terms of interest and like more, more soft factors about the audience. Um, yeah, you need to do what Avid said before. And I uh, talk to people, look into our communities, um, that that's, that's, um, that's insights that Facebook cannot really give you. Great. Thanks, uh, John for, uh, the question. I want to move on to a similar theme, which is customer acquisition. So let's say we have uncovered a problem, which is great. We've discussed with the community. We've validated or unvalidated uh, our assumptions. Now it's time to go out there. We have a, a, an MVP or a prototype, and it's time to, to win new customers. And I think both of you have used a variety of customer acquisition tactics. Many of them were not necessarily paid. So what would you recommend to our audience? Uh, if you can share maybe a few uh, ideas, tactics, or, or experiments that you've run that ended up being relatively successful. I, I can start with one that, that probably is the, the most uh, work intense one, but it's actually building a meaningful audience around a personal brand as an expert in a space. This is going to take you a long time. And it's going to take a lot of work, like consistent work of providing value to people without asking for anything in return. But once you have this critical mass of an audience around you, to and, and again, this is talking about expert B two B tools because I I am I don't have the experience in the B two C space, so I'm just not going to talk about this. But in a space where you, as a founder, can be part of the community of people where um, they listen to you and they are interested in your solution to their problems because they know you care about it, that's where the mouth level of marketing that you can do. Because when you talk about something and your audience amplifies this to their peers, like you don't have to pay a cent for that. Right? You just need to put out valuable stuff that your audience actually wants to amplify. So the, I've been doing this with my own writing, I've essentially with my mm -hmm. own um, like info products that I've been selling the book, right? Um, and I'm working on another book and I'm building this in public with the people that are hopefully gonna buy and read it in the future. So everything I do is potential marketing material for my work that is transmitted to other people that might be interested in it by the people that listen to me, that are my audience, that are my, they follow me because I help them Right. I help them without asking them to buy my stuff. I just help them. I, I share most of my book. The content of my book is freely available on my blog and it's freely available on Twitter because I throw it out there not to lure people in, but to actually help them. And I know that at some point there's reciprocity where they want to help me back for having helped them so much. And that's when you have the monetary exchange, right? When you can sell, I sell something and here's you can buy this. You don't have to, but you could. And then they buy this and then they talk about this interaction and the quality of the work and they spread it out there. And with Feedback Panda, there was the exact same thing. Like within these communities and outside of uh, th those particular initial Facebook communities where we started on Instagram, because um, on online teachers, they hang out on Instagram as well. Danielle, my, my partner, she was the, the, the CEO of the company and she was dealing with all the marketing and all the, um, the, the customer outreach and all this stuff. She was just becoming a presence in the space. She talked to other teachers that were like these kind of lighthouse people that gathered other people around them from the community and were setting trends and talked about how to become a better online teacher. And so was Danielle. And she inserted herself into that space, became a notable figure and talked to other people in the space and just brought people into the community. Right? That, that, and our customer acquisition was mostly word of mouth because we were just out there and people were talking with us about interesting topics and the other people were just invited into this conversation by, by people that we were interacting with telling them, hey, come here, this is interesting. 
Um, another thing we did uh, was really highlighting people from our community, like from our existing customer community. We had a monthly, uh, weekly newsletter that went out. And the most important thing in the newsletter was featuring one random customer that we had in our little, at this point, probably three to 4,000 customer business and, and telling the story of this person in our newsletter. So instead of pushing our features or anything like that, we pushed their story. We turned the customer, the individual, the actual person with a photo of them with their dog or them with their kids, like hanging out on a vacation. And we put that front and center in all our communication. And that was a, like, this is an email you can forward, right? Like if you, if you have a cool story about a person and it comes from, it came from Feedback Panda, but it was all about this teacher. Hey, you forward this to a couple of your friends. Look at this, look at this person's story. Isn't that kind of cool? And all of a sudden we have just a couple more people coming and checking out our product. This is the self-perpetuating marketing. And we did that because we were so tight with our community and we understood how much they like sharing. And honestly, this is teachers. Teachers like to help other people, right? Teachers really want to share what they know. So we, we kind of leverage that within our community. Might not work in every community, but you can definitely try, right? It's always good to highlight people and make it about your customers more than making it about your product. Um, Alexei, you want to take this or um, before we take Danielle's question, which is very linked to that? You're, you're on mute, uh, Alexei. Maybe Avid wants to answer the, the, the question, which are also related to B2B, I guess, and then I can talk about B2C, which is like quite different. Yeah, so Danielle's question is how do I build a, an audience without a paid advert? I sell both online and offline training. I think mm -hmm. Arvid, you've, you've I think yeah. you've experimented and, and shared that on Twitter, your method to grow your, let's right. say your, your community on Twitter. Maybe that's, that's a good yeah, thing. Yeah. I, I, I have three pillars to, to audience building and, and that's like essentially engagement going to where people already are talking and joining their conversations without being pushy, just being adding value to this. Um, then, uh, empowerment, like getting people that are, um, not hurt much, giving them more attention, like sharing their successes, their failures, their questions, their whatever they have with the world, and then creating content, which is a like a third kind of, um, it's, it's equally important, but in particular, when you're starting to build an audience and you have no following, creating content is like yelling into the void, right? Imagine, um, Daniel, you create like a, a, a little tiny online course that is like 10% of what you actually have as a paid offering and you would share it on Twitter and you have like 10 followers, like it goes nowhere, right? Nobody looks at this because nobody sees it. So this doesn't really help. Content is something for a later stage, but the, in the beginning, if you want to build an audience, you go to that community that you might already be part of and you see, Hey, these people, and I don't really know what kind of training you offer your audience, these people that you, you offer this training for, um, you go to where they are, you find the influencers in this community, the people that other people follow, the people with a high follower count that are engaging with their community, and you turn on notifications whenever they talk about something that uh, you find interesting, you start engaging with this. It's like essentially what I call an audience audition. You go in front of their audience and you provide something meaningful, something valuable to the ongoing conversation. You don't start with throwing your stuff in there or paid advertising. This can not really go too far, particularly not in the beginning. It just won't help you much. You're going to waste a lot of money on these experiments. But if you go into these existing communities and you share what you know, either with a little video or just a, a Twitter thread on what you can add to this particular discussion, other people will start finding this interesting and they will start following you. And you talk to them, right? People who follow you, you say, thank you. What are you talking about? What are, what are your problems? How can I help you? You start helping people in public. And by that act, other people will start following you. And this is how you build this kind of following to which you can eventually start producing content. You can make a, a little short version of your course or just hint at something like a 30 minute clip, share it with people, write blog posts about what you know, share that with people, engage with people, empower people and share. And that is how you build an audience. And the most important thing is do it consistently. Every day, show up help people, engage with people where they are, do the same thing, maybe 20 minutes a day, do the same thing next day, the next day, the next day. And after a couple of weeks, a couple of months, just this act of being there all the time 
will get people to pay interest to you, pay attention to what you have to say. And then at some point you can say, well, I have this thing that I sell. Obviously you can always link it in your bio or in your description or something. And then you can start selling stuff to people, but always preload with value, give something to them so they feel, okay, this is an interesting person to follow and wait for them to be ready to reciprocate. That That is my experience audience building. And I've, I don't know, I, I think I reached 15,000 people on Twitter following me uh, just a week ago or something. Two years ago, I had 300, right? This is like, this takes a while, but it's absolutely worth it because when I now try to say something, people actually listen and they share it with their peers and their the, the, the group uh, that they are part of. And that um, will help you with your training as well. Yeah, and, and I think all the effort that you put in is uh, has a kind of compounding effect afterwards because you have a critical mass. And then when you start sharing things, people really listen to you. Uh, Alex, say, let's go back. Uh, oh, well, thanks, Daniel, for the question. Let's just go back to customer acquisition. Maybe, I mean, you advise a lot of early stage startups. What are the, the things that have worked or not worked? with uh, either your own experience or the startups that you're, you're, you're supporting? Yeah, so in the, in the classic um, startup uh, ecosystem, um, they, they go to places paid performance marketing, right? So Instagram ads and, and Google ads and whatever. And this, that's also where I start my career. But now I'm saying this is an addict, this, that's a drug. So, and, and you should not start with drugs, right? So, I mean, you can have them from time to time, it's nice, but I mean, for some, yeah, alcohol is also a drug, right? I mean, it's illegal. But generally, you should really reduce them to a really low, low limit in general. And I think for paid marketing and performance marketing, the same holds. So what, so what does it mean? It means that in general, you need to find your non-paid marketing or non-performance marketing marketing strategies. And that can be hard, but it is actually hard. Um, and and some might not find it. But I think that's that's where the focus needs to, needs to lie. So now going into that. So, so there, 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 I think there's one, so there, there, there's one way which is, I think, the most sustainable, and that's basically making your product social, uh, or your product or the experience around the product. So what does it mean? I mean, B2C is it's always right. So you personally, it's not the business. So it's like leisure, or you're solving your problems that your friends have. So it's always like something that is relevant for your for your friends, for your family, for uh, the people around you. So basically, every almost every consumer product inherently can be integrated into a social experience. And what that means is also really different per product. So I will just give you some examples. So for Dora, it's about obviously food ordering and eating. And usually eating is often with others, right? So dinner table with your family, lunch with your colleagues, breakfast with your spouse, whatever. Um, it's really social, actually. Um, so, so what we realized that um, a big driver of growth in Fedora was uh, friends and family. So we asked, like, how do you know Fedora? And we know that a really, really big share. And and all the effort I did on on you know you know spending all the money on Google and Facebook and you know doing <laughs> being invited to restaurants, or whatever from that, that money. But in the end, it didn't you know didn't move the needle that much because the product was so social. Because you need to. Uh, so, 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 the, so the interesting insight was that. We had a minimum order value of 12 euro, 15 euro, which makes it basically quite expensive for one person to order. So it's like, in general, eating food is social and we make it difficult to order from us just for ourselves. So in the end, every food order was always for others as well. Then then we have the bag with a big Fedora, a pink uh, you know, logo. And that means that whenever you were co-ordering with someone else, you also find out automatically uh, um, about Fedora. Uh, we didn't realize for a long time. We didn't build a feature. We didn't support it. We didn't embrace this. So, so now looking back, we should have said Fedora is a really, really social brand, and it's it's not actually about the food. It's also about food, but it's more about eating together and and what happens when you have food coming yeah, to you easily um, uh, that where you don't need to worry about it. So, so that's one example. Another one is no no, no matter which, which which business you have. Um, uh, or, or, or a framework, no matter which business you have, let, let's try to think about how can you create more value to the customer by making it social. So, for example, if you if there's some some kids class which was um, uh, in, in 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 the comments. So, how can you integrate 
the parents of other kids into this. So what if, so for example, you have a I know, Ch Chinese, my brother is uh, learning Chinese. So, so what if his friends uh, also uh, want to learn Chinese or the, the parents think that it could be interesting. So why cannot my brother, for example, invite his friends into a, you know, test class, a project, something fun, where they can get exposed to the, the same class, right? So it's really trying to, to integrate a social experience into a product. And then you get this, this, this variety going. The prerequisite for this is that they are happy about the experience, right? So if they're not happy, then they will not integrate, you know, involve the others around them because, you know, but if they, re if they really like it, and you, yeah, then it's then it's happening, and and be and be basically saying, okay, I want to achieve this. I want to make my product more social. This is what most people don't do. It's like ah, I, I do this referral program, and then no, that's not hard work. You need to really say, how can I make sure that I create additional value for my customers when they involve their friends? That's the key question to answer, um, and that's really you know different answer for every single uh, business. I want to yeah. I want to um, hook in here because I I'm I, I, glad that you mentioned referral programs and they often not working. Uh, I just want to point that out that, like there's an inherent shareability to every business and it's very different depending on what the business is actually about. Right? There are businesses businesses that are super shareable where the social strategy is extremely valuable and I think education is one um food is definitely one, right? Because it's everything that has a communal aspect where um, the more people, the better, where the network effect is stronger. That is a shareable thing. But then there's businesses where if you exclude people, you actually get an edge. You're becoming better. It's like if you start fin financial trading, right? You don't want to share a really good financial trading sourcing tool with other people because if they have this information on how to trade better, you trade worse, right? Shareability of that tool may be not a given or a tool that shows that you are... Um, that, that you are incapable of solving a problem without a tool. That is not a tool that you would like to share. Like right? imagine you are in debt, you're heavily in debt, and there's a service out there that allows you to get out of debt by making smarter decisions. Like, are you gonna share this with your family? Are you gonna tell people that oh, I, I'm so in debt that I have to use this service to get out of debt? Right? There's this kind of status game going on in your mind as well. So when it comes to shareability and referability of a, of a business, make absolutely sure that your business is even compatible with such a system. Right? B2B is more like this. I think a B2C um, market there, the shareability and, and social is almost inherent in every single business that is going into this market just from the the approach you have to be able to be viral. So you have to build something that has to um, appeal to a lot of people. But for specific tools, specific expert tools, that might be the opposite. Like you might actually want to keep other people from knowing that you're using this for whatever reason, either for your benefit or for not hurting your social status or just showing that you're in control of things instead of showing that you're living in a chaotic world and, you know, all these little things. So shareability is an important concept. Just wanted to add that at this point because that really impacts how you can approach the viral loop or if you can approach it at all. I, I agree, and I would add something in the sense that Alexei had a really good point when he said, well, for people to share, they have to have a really good experience. And I think if you think about that from the get-go, it changes pretty much how you can potentially grow your business because a lot of startups just, you know, they build their funnel and they just want to get users through that funnel as fast as they can. And one concept that I really like is the... The flywheel uh, concept and i know there's a lot of flywheels the one i'm referring to is not so much the the amazon type of, of flywheel but more the hubspot flywheel where they basically instead of having a funnel you have a flywheel and put the customer at the center and basically your customers ultimately become part of your marketing right because they are having a good experience and one of the big problems startups have also is with retention right they're getting users they're getting the, the growth but then people are not sticking uh, around. So I think your point was, is uh, kind of a, you know, killing uh, two birds with one stone in a sense because you start really thinking about retention and experience from you know, the inception, let's say, of the, of the idea. Um, very briefly, I want to cover two questions. So Ankur was talking, you kind of touch on this, uh, let's say, a bit. Uh, but I think he's saying, how can I pitch an educational solution without being salesy? And I think 
it does not necessarily apply uh, only to education. I think not being salesy is something that a lot of people aspire to, but don't necessarily know how to. Any advice for our audience on, on this? So, in, 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 I mean, it depends really on the context. Um, um, but I think what applies both for sales calls and for, for ads, it's, um, it's not about the product that you're selling. It's about the person you're selling to. Um, so in sales calls, you should always do first discovery. Like, so, so what's your issue? How do you solve this problem? Um, so basically, so if it's, um, you know, parents that, that uh, might uh, want to book foreign uh, language classes for the kids. So, so wh wh why not, uh, why not, uh, using one, um, uh, which, which language and what are the problems, uh, that, that your kids have. Right. So we really understanding, 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 um, and only as soon as you you are sure that what you're offering um, really solves those problems, then you can switch gears. But then it's like, but then it's not like, by the way, we have this product. But it's also, but it's more like, um, so so what if a solution would do that? Uh, yeah, actually that would be a good idea. And what if the a solution would do that? Uh, actually, that's a good idea. So so and, and then you can basically integrate uh, or like, um, you know, move to. By the way. Um, that's also not, that's also what, what we offer. So maybe that's interesting for you. And it's like ah yeah, and, and based on this on this call that you had or this conversation, then they um, then it's not selling. Then it's just this is what we do, and then they will come to you because already you know that this is what they need, and 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 they will trust over the over the call. Uh, on the on the marketing side, when you do basically just ads, um, then it's trying to understand what the problem is. For example, um, the quality is bad. Then it's finally a high quality uh, or a trusted um, a service um, if the problem is it's not flexible enough then finally a flexible right so it's really really trying to understand the problem and and, and highlighting the, the 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 value proposition that you have instead of we offer as a service that does one two three four five that's not what people you know they, they're interested about their own problems being solved and and when you put this in front then it's working and you'll need to be salesy yeah, I, I agree with this completely. Like the the more you can be feel involved with the actual reality of these people, the more you can show the the people in this community that you, you quite likely have. There's a lot of people that go to their Facebook groups to find online teachers for foreign languages for their kids, right? And they, they kind of build these little communities where people share information. The more you are not just a person selling to them, but you're one of them. You understand where they're coming from. You you solve this problem because you understand that they need this solved. Like they have this need, and they um, without you, they wouldn't have an advocate for for their um, for their need. If you can communicate this with them for them, then you have a much much higher chance of eventually selling your product than if you just throw in, hey, we are this. You you uh, buy this, right? This is not not a way to approach approach a community. So I think um, there's a couple of layers here. Uh, first off, you want to be part of this community. You not just want to like put throw ads in there. You actually want to be an active member of this community beyond your sales efforts. You want to help them. You want to communicate with them. You want to just be a, a part of this community. And that's hard to do at scale. I'm quite aware of that, right? It's hard to do this in a group of hundreds of thousands of people, but you can still try. And if you if you find a couple, there will be resonance and, and word of mouth effects that will get you this large amount of people that you want to have use your product eventually. But you have to start with doing things that don't scale. Essentially, like the whole Paul Graham methodology of trying to find your first couple customers, your first couple dozen of customers by having these direct conversations, what Alex was saying, like really doing customer exploration, figuring out what the problems are, solving it, and then up giving them the opportunity to be part of the solution, not just to buy the solution, but to be part of the development and improvement of the solution. Give your community the option to join your product for either for free or as a beta tester or something like this and make the thing with them. Like that will generate so much interest and so much, oh, this is one of us and we're doing this together. And particularly in the, in the nascent stages of a product in the beginning, that you will have these, these evangelists that are part of this community already that will tell, hey, this is the person that do, they built this with us and they built this exactly to our specification to what we needed. Right? If you can make people feel involved, they, they will just have so, uh, so much easier time buying and then marketing your product to their peers. And um, one thing that helps here is speaking their language. 
not speaking your language, not telling them what you think they should hear, but actually using the words, the concepts, and the, the yeah, just the lingo that they have within the community. That will make you be a part of their community, and that will make it less of a sale and more of a conversation. Right? If you use the same words, if you use the same constructs, then it will feel, okay, this person gets me. What they offer here is something that they built for me, not just for people like me, but for me. And that is um, that is an important part. And that's, that's what I would try to do for as long as possible, is have this community involvement and this connection to this community and, and try to sell and figure out how you can effectively sell to these people without b becoming pushy. Because they don't want to just push stuff in in, in, in their path, they shouldn't be surprised by what you're selling. They should kind of anticipate what you're selling and hope that you sell it. And if you can generate that by being part of a community, by consistently engaging with them and helping them where they are, um, then the sale will be a much easier thing. But that will take time and a lot of effort. I'm sorry for that. That's not going to be a hack, right? You're not going to be doing this within a couple of days. Like this is a, a week and month of effort kind of building path that you have to go down but it will again um like what michelle was saying like that there is a, this kind of um compound effect to this like the more you put in the more it will eventually come back to you mm -hmm. well guys i'm very disappointed i was looking for silver bullets to this morning so <laughs> you're telling me it's hard to build a startup that's it yeah um yep. slav, we're, slav we're gonna get to your question uh but before i'm um, just looking at, at the time that we have left one of the things that I want to cover is uh, a bit maybe more esoteric to a certain sense, but running a startup is very tough. There's so many moving parts and uh, it's so easy to get lost. We've talked about, uh, you know, an ad or make, moving the needle or not. There is, I think, a superpower that startups uh, leaders need is, is prioritization. And I know that I think the three of us are all big fans of having systems and building systems. What advice do you have for uh, the people listening to us on prioritizing, working on the right things? Because it's very easy to get up in the morning, look at your inbox, <clears throat> and then your whole plan, the whole plan you had the day before is, is gone. So how do you actually manage things and, and prioritize? I mean, do you want to start? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, of course. Um, I don't know. <laughs> no, I can also time start. Time. It's fine. Yeah, okay, go, go right okay, for it. Okay, okay. So, so, um, so I, I try to... Um, so I think there's some really easy things to do, which are like really hands-on, because I mean, in, the, in the end, when I have a problem that, that I'm like overloaded with too many things and, and I cannot do anything, the evening before, I take a, a note, like a post-it, and just write maximum three things down. And if it's four or five, sometimes I do it. The next day, I, I regret it. <laughs> so it should be max three, right? And then and then you have basically your post-it. You can even put it on, on your screen, right? And you look at it, and then you you know you, you start with the first one, and then maybe you just get distracted, and then it's two p.m. It's like okay, back to the first one. Yeah, it's, get distracted. Okay, four p.m. Get back to the first one, and then you will have at least you know. Um, uh, at, at least um, solve the first one, but basically really writing down for you somewhere, doesn't matter what was the number one, two, three, I think that's that's really, really key um, because otherwise in this on online world, um, you're not gonna get done what you need to do. And the second question is what should be one, two, three? Uh, that, that's the other important question. Um, so here I, uh, so different, different frameworks, I try to take a long-term perspective and it depends on whether you do it for you personally or whether if you're a company, uh, for employees, doesn't matter. But basically, you should have a long-term goal and vision. And this can be, I want to get the next funding round. This can be, um, uh, I don't know, I want to learn a certain language. This can be, I uh, want to earn, so I want to get this promotion. Doesn't matter what it is, but you need to have a long-term goal. I mean, um, it, it can be whatever, two, two months, three weeks, six months, or five years, doesn't matter, depending on what you what you, what you feel comfortable with. Uh, but you need to have this, this goal in in the startup lingo. Um, you can also say the North Star metric. And so, for example, I want to get I want to get to a certain amount of active customers. So I want to whatever. And then and then when you have the vision or the goal clear that that is the most important for you, then you can derive what you need to do today, right? And and for startups, very concretely, it's often next funding round. 
if you have 18 months of, of uh, runway, basically you, you don't need to fundraise for 18 months, then you can focus the next six months on doing what really, really, really is high value for customers and the business. But if you need to fundraise in six months, then the next two, three months are 1% focused on getting the money in in six months. Right? So, um, and and um, and making and making understanding the the core goal that you need to optimize for. I think that's that's key. And that's you know it's like taking time, blocking, thinking about what is the goal, huh? uh, and and then you come out of that. Actually, uh, many startups do an offsite where they where they go somewhere else, uh, lock them in for a day, and then they come out with you know the goal, which is often like just a three point bullet list. That's really Thanks. nice. And it, it does remind me of what um, Michael E. Gerber was writing about in the the E Myth, the book, the entrepreneurial myth. Like for an entrepreneur, most people start out as, as a technician. Like they they are really good at doing something, right? And it doesn't matter if it's a digital business or if it's like a um, traditional brick and mortar store. They're either they're they're, re they're really good at something. I'm a good engineer, or I'm a good marketer. I've got to build a software. Or I'm going to create an agency. But that's not all. You also need to be able to manage so you need to be the technician the manager and the visionary and that's that's what alex I just really mentioned like you need to have this vision you need to have the uh, where am i going with this why am i even doing this right what am i doing this for and if if you only are the technician then you work only in a day to day you're building stuff right and you forget what you're building it for if you're only the manager you only like organize stuff you, you, you may talk to customers back and forth and keep st keep things running but there's no innovation there's no no technical improvement or anything and if you're only a visionary then you're only thinking in the future and you never build something and you never like organize your day to day it's just you need to be all three at once and that is hard and i guess the first thing is to understand that this is important like the, the first thing is to understand that you need to build stuff you need to organize stuff and you need to have a vision and all these three, at different times of um, your, your journey, ha have priority. Sometimes you need to continue building. Sometimes you need to just deal with uh, the day-to-day -day operations of the business. And sometimes you need to take some time offsite or not and deal with where am I going to be in a couple couple months, couple years. And this prioritization is the hardest, I feel, like t figuring out which of these three is important right now. But if you have the feeling of balance, um, and, and you you say okay I can I can time block I can take like a couple days now and just really do engineering and then I take one day and I, I deal with the finances and then I take uh, like just a couple hours to dream right and write it down and then I repeat this that that is already already helpful setting up a schedule in general setting up time blocking like just really taking amounts of hours to deal with one particular thing is extremely helpful because there will be interruptions all the time but at least knowing what you go back to is helpful right okay oh this was supposed to be my engineering time is it more important um to know about that than to actually do the engineering time right because you know, it's just for the mind to know what's important at this point and what helps with that is um, and this is maybe more tactical, remove notifications. Remove the non-critical notifications from your life. Turn off Twitter notifications, turn off desktop notifications. I mean, if you have a software business, keep the notifications for downtime. If your thing goes down, you might want to get a notification for that, right? Because there's important stuff. But turn off those um, non-critical notifications so you can actually have the time to yourself was a big mistake that I made during Feedback Panda. I had notifications coming in for every kind of thing. A little non-critical software error somewhere in the front end, notification, got an email. And I looked into this, and all of a sudden, I was like digging into something that I could have waited until next week. Or a customer conversation came in that was automatically handled by our intercom system, and I still looked into that. Why did I do that? I could have just continued building the software that I was currently building. And it just like, derailed my mind and pulled me out of the reality that I should have been focused on at that time. So notifications, t take them as far as possible from you time block what you already have what else did i write down oh yeah prioritization frameworks right everything you do there is a potential way that you can actually score it along a couple of metrics there's the die the demand impact and effort um framework and then there's there's rice i think which is like reach impact uh what's the, the other thing complexity or something confidence, and, confidence. confidence thank you and and uh, effort there's all these frameworks we can score um, whatever you're looking at and say, OK, how, how, how many people am I helping with this? And particularly in, in the beginning of a business, that is maybe the most important one, right? Reach or, or impact, both of them, is like, if I do this now, will it reach all of my customers? Or is this one thing that I built for this one person out of 100? 
And if you have a framework, you can just really quickly go through it and you see, okay, this may not be as important as I thought. So building systems through automation to take work away from you, get the notifications out of the way, and having a clear process to deal with anything that comes your way, this is going to free up a lot of time and, and cognitive space for you so you can actually deal with the things that are important at any given point. Agreed. I, I think uh, one way that I like to, to to prioritize is to just ask myself, is this going to help me acquire new customers or is this going to help me make them happy or happier and keep them? Mm -hmm. I mean, because ultimately, th these are this is what drives the, your business, right? Yeah. Um, just before we go, uh, I know Slav has a question. I think he's referring to the gorillas of this world. Mm -hmm. I don't know, Alexei, you may have an opinion on this. Or Arvid, <laughs> you think there is still room for regional market winners in the ultra fast or the booming online grocery delivery startups? Any opinions on this? Yeah, so, so, so my opinion is that um, in the long run, it's going to be a combination of a local team uh, and a global player because you have a big kind of your scale on the funding side because that, that kind of business with lots of money. And the bigger the business, the easier it is to get this money. Um, so just because of this reason, there will be consolidation. But um, so if you look at Delivery Hero, for example, um, the successful ones uh, have really, really strong local teams. Right? So, so that's why I think there will be strong regional players, but they, but they might be under the umbrella of a bigger player. Yeah, and, and I guess they just have to, because like if you want to accomplish 10 to 15 minute um, delivery windows, you will need to work with people locally, right? This isn't something where you can like they build warehouses somewhere and out of nowhere and deliver maybe within a day, like what Amazon is doing, because they have the logistic chains that, that work pretty well. But if you have this time window, the, the, these dark stores that are currently being employed by the gorillas and, and all these other services in the world, they need to be quite where people are. Right, so uh, it's um, that's an interesting question because you have the the organizational part, which is likely going to be consolidated, but then you have the the on-premise logistics that is probably going to be distributed in a way, right? Where you have a lot of local players, so it's 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 truly like a local business where you you, you have to kind of combine these two. I'm super interested because first off, I'm a customer of these stores. Like all my snacks are being delivered by people in in a black uh, outfit on a bike at this point. Um, also because of Corona, that that definitely sped up this delivery stuff but um i i, I still want to see it like actually working unit economics there because i i do have a, a some doubt that this is actually feasible the way it's currently built without um employing a different strategy but i don't really want to go too deep into that i definitely see this being um a mixture of a, a big global player that consolidates all this also um, when it comes to like the the tooling um maybe this this is a slightly different thing but vault this, I don't know if they Finnish or Swedish or something, um, but they have been uh, getting a lot of headway in the food delivery space because they actually built a really good app, right? They, they built an extremely good user experience and reliable delivery system, just friendly people, right? They, they just they got the hiring right. They got the, the business right and all things around that. So, you, and they are essentially a global company with a lot of service in a lot of different cities in a lot of countries. So if that works for them, I, I see the same thing happening in the online grocery delivery system. It's just um, the logistics are slightly different. And maybe not even that much. Okay, I'm, I'm not going to go into this right now. It's, it's a super interesting topic to think about. But there's a difference between going to a restaurant, picking up an order, and having everything, have to have everything available in a dark store somewhere. There, there are slight differences there, but it's a super interesting space. I think it's time to grab a beer. Uh, it's maybe a bit early. <laughs> yeah, but. <laughs> At ten o'clock somewhere, right? Yeah. So, uh, so we've talked about building your audience first, uh, validating your ideas, making sure that you test the ideas and your assumptions before you actually start building something. We've covered a few customer acquisition strategies and uh, prioritization framework. Before I let you go, guys, any final thoughts or comments or advice for our audience? Mm -hmm. I think so. Any ideas? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So, so I think what, what I'm saying actually everyone is focus on creating value for your customers. Right. I, I, I don't think I, I could say anything better, but let me try. Um, beyond building a great business, which is obviously um, everybody's mission at this point, help other founders. 
like be, be part of the founder community because um, th this is something that, that many people forget. Like you don't need to build this all by yourself. There's a community out there that is willing to help each other. Like we're quite literally doing this at this moment, right? Trying to help other people build better businesses, become part of these communities, join them and actually help other people help them, right? And um, just build your own business, help other people build their business and they will help you build yours. It's, it's an exchange as well. So don't think you need to go at this alone. Don't, don't think you need to learn everything by yourself and fail and fail and fail all over the place. You could just have a conversation with other founders and they will, I mean, you still have to fail and you still have to learn, but they will help you see how you can improve and how you can come out of this the better person. So just like, try to become part of the founder community if you're not already there and be active, like help people, give them your opinion, like just as much as you listen to us today and now they're thinking about what we said, talk to other people and allow them to think about what you said. It's always good. It's always adding value to people. I agree. And I think uh, hanging out with other founders is also useful because it's such a roller coaster. It's good to have other folks who are on the same roller coaster as you. So I, I want to thank you so much for your time, uh, both Arvid and Alexei, for your time, for your generosity uh, and for the audience. Also, thanks for the, the great questions. Uh, one last thing, if you want to follow these guys, Alexei, uh, you're quite active on LinkedIn, if I'm not mistaken. Arvid, you're more of a Twitter type of person. Uh, so um, you know where to find them. And uh, have a great end of day. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right. Ciao. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.